Hello and welcome to the first of a two-part note in which we're going to be discussing a new book which is adding to the literature in trying to explain where financial crises come from, what the history is and how we might even be able to avoid financial crises in future. The book is called Money Mania and with me now to discuss it is the author Bob Swarup. Bob, thank you very much for joining me. Today. John, my pleasure to be here. Now, let's start by the one very interesting question, which is why did you choose to start your book with this man, the Roman Emperor Augustus? Well, Augustus to me, of course, was the original Keynesian, long before Keynes ever came up with his theories. Right. And I think with my book, what is fascinating to me was that if you go all the way back in history to the Roman Empire, mm. and even before that, to the ancient Greeks in the fourth century BC, what we actually find is that there's this constant pattern of financial crises that is always there. And it really seems as old as we have records. And what to me was fascinating was that the first ever recorded sovereign default was in the fourth century BC in ancient Greece. Rome, right. of course, had its own version of the Great Depression. And yet, two and a half thousand years on, we find ourselves making the same mistakes again and again and again. And the themes are very common. It's trying to understand really what those themes are and how they interlink with each other to create this constant cycle in our history. Now, what's interesting is although there's a constant cycle, there is a sort of also a sort of fairly constant, consistent trend towards growth. This is a glorious historic uh, details from uh, the Madison Project going back to, to the year 1 AD. So presumably the cycle of uh, crises can coexist with consistent growth. Well, I think it's actually very much part of our socioeconomic DNA. Right. You know, if you look at this chart here, what this chart really shows you is it shows you the growth of interactions that we have with mm. each other. It's actually a chart that shows the growth of complexity of human society. Right. I mean, if you have to break this chart down for a moment, what I would say to you is until the late Middle Ages, we really were right, running on a Malthusian sort of dynamic where we were growing in line with population. But thereafter, as technology came in, mm. the number of interactions flourished, people suddenly began to travel, globalization began to happen. And so what you suddenly have is an enormous surge of interactions. Right. It's an enormous surge, by the way, of money exchanging hands, of debt being formed between people and people. And so suddenly, you create this complex economy. Now, crises are very much a side product of that. Because when people are interacting with each other, when they are busy exchanging money and goods and services, part of that is unfortunately also intertwined with the fact that they are emotional creatures. We are right. all intendedly rational but we're also always ultimately constrained by the environment that we inhabit. Okay, now that's perhaps a little alarming because it suggests we are truly hardwired for crises. We are, all of us, emotional, and you've got a lot of work on behavioral psychology and what we've discovered about persistent errors we make. Also, if we could take a look at this beautiful diagram you produce, this, I gather, is a map of the internet. It suggests that complexity is continuing to grow, that we're growing ever more complex in our interactions. Is that fair? Complexity evolves very naturally. You know, I, mean, I think what's fascinating about this is that here you have a series of individuals around the world who have simply been exchanging you know, information across the World Wide Web. And they've evolved this order, this complexity, out of their, just their simple interaction with each other. Now this map, of course, by the way, if you mm. didn't know what it was, could easily have been a nebula in space, for example. Yeah. It could easily have been a map of the neurons in the brain. And I think if I was to take a picture of an economy, it would look very, very similar. And the complexity we have does grow. And I think the real problem one has is that you know, two and a half thousand years in the evolutionary landscape is not a very long period of time. And so what you have is a situation where the world is an increasingly complex place. Our brain, however, still continues to be about three pounds in weight throughout. Right. OK, so this begins to sound like a council of despair. Now, if we can begin to discuss the crisis that uh, some people would think is still going on, but obviously re reached its greatest point in 2008. One thing which is very interesting if we take a look at this, uh, this next chart is that um, in some ways it seems to have just accentuated a trend that had been going on for quite a long time, that money was not moving around the world's far biggest economy as fast as it once did. Are we reaching a crescendo of ever greater crises here com combined with the greater complexity? Well, I think you mentioned this being a message of despair. Mm. I think with crises, you have to remember that innovation is a positive crisis mm. and a financial crisis is a negative side. You know, very much the same biases that may drive us to be volatile on one level and cause bankruptcies and failures mm. are also the same biases that drive us to plow forward in a complete blind, um, sorry, in a blinkered fashion 
right. to actually go and you know create new products. And the dot com boom, I think, is a wonderful example of something which was a boom and a bust on one level, but also left us with the most amazing infrastructure that fueled the information revolution that created that beautiful map. Now, if I look at this chart here, mm. you know what you can see here is that the real economy has become increasingly disconnected from right. the financial economy. And if you look at what has happened in the last six years. I mean, I would argue the crisis hasn't really fully solved itself because what crises actually do is they often reveal structural fragilities in the system. And if they keep coming back round and round again, what it tells us is we're not addressing those fragilities. So we have a situation where we focus constantly on the urgent, which is at hand right now. We forget about the important, which unfortunately is tomorrow. And as the Romans would have described it and as Augustus has Beers described it, it was very much a vigorous beginning but often lapsing into a careless end. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed. We will continue this conversation later. Just for now, I think the big point to make is that crises are in many ways the, uh, the negative side that we have to put up with for innovations. It's not just dot coms that created a bubble, so did bicycles, so did railroads, so did canals, you name it. Innovation tends to come with a, an attendant crisis. In the second part, we're going to try to discuss how we might actually improve the situation, how we might make ourselves less prone to crises.